All right, guys, we'll go ahead and start us about 9.30. A few updates before we dive back into our case study concerning matrices. I have uh, some project notes. Uh, I've decided against the make files, and so don't worry about the make files. Inside of your cover letter, you'll also include compilation instructions. In the project post in Blackboard, you'll see that there are three items there, the instructions for the project uh, cover letter and a sample input file. And so we'll include the compilation instructions. Right. A few more notes. Nothing changed really. Uh, just notes about the uh, the cover letter. Uh, within the disclosures area, please disclose any sort of outside help you might have received during the project. This doesn't necessarily uh, preclude full points in, in all instances. Uh, the disclosures are there not just to uh, uh, just really the main goal is for full transparency. Um, in the disclosures, you do not need to disclose me. I assume that, that you are using the information that we are discussing in class. Uh, you do not need to disclose any of the four textbooks that I recommended. Right? Anything else, please disclose. Okay. Right. Uh, if you are having a discussion with someone right, at a very high conceptual level, and which is encouraged, permitted and encouraged, please include it in the disclosures. Again, the disclosure is just there to disclose where you got all the information from. Uh, it's not necessarily precluding any points. Right. However, right, if for some reason you decided that you wanted to use somebody else's design right, and implement it yourself to help with testing or to help with some part or aspect of the project, you, right, you must include this in the disclosures and if the, the basic concept underlying it uh, you do not understand and or you simply copied verbatim from some source, right, it will preclude the majority of the points allocated to that portion of the project or that aspect of the project. Uh, so, so again, just uh, full disclosure, uh, keep everything as clear and transparent and as open as possible uh, with respect to the disclosures. Um, all right, uh, this also uh, is a good time to remind everyone uh, in the syllabus and just sort of an overall for all projects in this class, Right, uh, you can be asked to at any point in time to explain any of your project submissions to me. If you cannot provide an explanation, if you cannot explain your own code, right, there will be some uh, changing of grades. So just make sure that the code is of your own design. You can explain it. You do understand it. It is it's your code. Uh, comments. Also use the cover letter as a means of communication to myself and or the TAs. Right, so there is a comments area in the, in the cover letter. Please use this to discuss and explain your submission. Uh, if you had any aspects that you thought were troublesome, any issues that you uh, that you encountered, uh, any parts of your code that may or may not be working 100%, feel free to point them out. That'll help us to sort of uh, parse through and dissect your code. Uh, also, feel free to explain your design decisions. So you're going to be faced with a large number of design decisions, right? Uh, when you're when you're uh, going through this project. So please feel free to explain them. If you decided to use a chaining structure, explain why. If you decided to use a, a, a contiguous array, a dynamic array structure, explain why. Uh, and you know, treat it as a persuasive argument. Try, try to convince me that this was a really good and efficient solution. Explain why. Explain your, your thought processes in making these design decisions. Uh, and of course, also include your compilation instructions. Right. With, now is probably also a good time uh, referring to design decisions. Uh, at this point, I noted that it's a good idea to spend about a third of your time right, designing. And this is a, a reasonable rough sketch. Right, about a third of your time coding. And about a third of your time testing. And you should all very likely still be in this design phase. And, uh, you can draw a simple analogy here to you know an architect or a building constructor. Right? If whenever they're handed a project, right, if you just start building right away without drawing the blueprint, right, you're going to end up with a crooked building very likely. Right? And if you guys start coding right away without designing your code, you're going to end up with a crooked data structure. Right? It's a perfect analogy. Right? <clears throat> but uh, in all seriousness, right, you're going to want to spend 
what, about three weeks we have in total here for the project. So the first week or so you want to spend designing, right? Come up with a few different design options. I right? use a contiguous structure, a non-contiguous structure. Try to make it as sparse or as efficient as possible. And, and then based on that design of the structure, write out the pseudocode, write out the, the algorithmic steps for all of the operations that you're going to perform on that data structure, right? And see which design decisions lead to the most efficient implementation for each of the processes, each of the algorithms that are going to be used on that structure. Right? I encourage you to do all of that before even beginning coding. And right? otherwise you, it's very likely you'll start coding, right? Hit a point when, when you're implementing maybe multiply, right? Or, or add or something. And you realize, wow, this is gonna be really inefficient given the way I've designed this data structure, right? And rather than making a quick change to that point, you're probably gonna have to go back change the basic design of your data structure and which will result in you having to change all of the code that you have written so far, right? So it'll be a very inefficient, right, uh, scheme for producing code, right? So again, I think I've reinforced it now ad nauseum, right? Spend, spend good time uh, in the design phase for these uh, projects. And any questions about any of these updates for the project or notes about the project? Yeah. Do we have a solid DVD? The project? Yeah. Yeah, the project, um, the due date is on Blackboard. So when I posted it, I used the Blackboard calendar to assign the due date for the project. Uh, it's about three weeks after the post date. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Maybe about two, two and a half weeks from now. October 6th? Okay, October 6th. Ish. Uh, very shortly, probably by the end of the week, I will choose an exam one day, given our progress, how far we've gotten through uh, these next few slide decks. We'll choose an exam one day, probably around, this is not a fixed date, but probably around October 13th-ish. I think that's a, a Thursday. If it's, it's not a Tuesday or Thursday, obviously it'll be on a Tuesday or Thursday. The exam will be in class. But somewhere mid-October, you can plan on an exam date. Does anyone have a time conflict with October 13th-ish? Any volleyball, basketball, track players, any athletes going to be traveling? Okay. All right, any other questions before we continue on with our case study? <coughs> The structure of the test will be short answer and coding, uh, primarily. I will post a sample exam or some sample questions. So uh, you guys are going to be familiar with the style of question. I don't want you to be surprised when you get the exam really. Expecting a completely different format or completely different style. Uh, so I will give you guys some sample questions. So you sort of have a ballpark of what to expect. All right. All right. So, diving back into our case study of matrices, uh, matrix is a very common data structure. Uh, we we started off with a very simple implementation. Intuitively, we have a two D structure here, two D table. Uh, we are going to implement it simply as a two D array. <coughs> right, within this implementation, uh, we'll note that we will design this data structure using object oriented methods. And we will encapsulate our actual data itself into a 2D array, and then we'll need a few member variables to help with the management of our structure. Can you, well, just like, but just, do you record all of the lectures? I am going to try to record all of the lectures. I would not rely 100% on them, but I'm attempting to record them all. Sometimes there are technical difficulties, so I don't want anyone to rely solely upon those. Uh, but I will try. You will miss with some of our impromptu examples on the board and things of that nature, but I think it, all in all, you can hear me. So even if you can't necessarily see when I'm writing on the board, you should be able to hear. All right, and then we decided to implement a few basic uh, member methods using matrix, matrix class. We'll want to implement some of the basic uh, matrix. So for our case study here, we'll look at uh, add, transpose, and I'll encourage you to implement multiply at home. Right, I believe we left off on this example. 
and at the end of our last class. It's a matrix transpose. Right? We took a, a look at this snippet here, this particular piece of code, and there are a number of interesting observations that we made with respect to some of our design decisions here. Right? Uh, we first noted the time complexity here. We have uh, an embedded loop structure. The first loop is controlled by the number of rows, the second loop by the number of columns. So the time complexity of this is going to be and we have a constant number of operations here in the body of the innermost loop. So the number of uh, computational steps here is going to be big theta of number of rows times number of columns. You guys have any questions at any point? We also noted some space requirements. There are some interesting design decisions here we made. Right, we decided to make a copy of the transpose. And we did this for our, we decided to make a copy of the matrix and not do the transpose in place. There's a couple of reasons for this. Right? Number one, if we were to do these, this transpose in place, right, we would be destroying, in a sense, right, the calling object. Right? That is, we would do the transpose of the calling object in that calling object space, and thus, in a sense, corrupting the original, the original uh, matrix. You can see here, right, this might not be an intuitive idea, Right? If space was really, really sparse and we never needed to use that original matrix again, we might consider it. <coughs> but generally speaking, you don't necessarily want to corrupt the data of a calling object. So, for example, if we wanted to, in some main method, do something like an A transpose right, times B plus A transpose times C, right? If our transpose actually manipulates A rather than making a copy and returning the copy, uh, the transpose copy, right? Then when we go to do this transpose, our matrix may be at the wrong size, and we're going to get a, an error. Right. So we put it up well. All right. All right. So that was one design decision we were faced with. It was a trade-off between space. We decided to use the extra space, right? Because in all likelihood, we're gonna we're gonna want that extra copy. It's very likely we're gonna need it. We want to keep the original data in A, and if we need to transpose it, we'll just make an extra copy. Any other comments? Well, I think we also noted, or possibly we noted that this one, right? That we decided here to return an actual matrix right, rather than maybe pointer to a matrix. Maybe here. Right. So, what sort of implications might this might this have on our space requirements, time requirements for our algorithm? <coughs> yeah. One second. Yeah. Right. So, about how how much longer? Even on, you can let me know later. Yeah. V double. Okay. So, so right. So here, note that we have a uh, matrix object. We call the constructor. So we have we've created a local variable of type matrix in here, right? And then we're going to return it here, right? In C plus plus. This is going to be a Returned by copy default for a class. Right, very likely in this matrix class, and right, we noted that we're going to have a, a pointer right, to some 2D array. Right, and then we also have maybe an int call and row. Something like this, right? And so here we have the matrix object that we're going to copy. Right, so what's going to happy, happen with this particular copy? We're going to copy the call here, and we're going to copy the row here. What about our what about our our matrix here? Our pointer to the matrix. What might happen in this instance if we're doing a return by copy? Do you want to continue on? Right, so uh, you noted that by making this copy of, of our matrix, we're going to double right, uh, the amount of processing time to perform that copy. Right? So in, within this context of the design of our matrix, 
right? It, again, assuming that we've implemented matrix as a class, we are going to have a member that's pointer to a 2D array, right? And then maybe two, at least two other members to keep track of the management of the matrix. Right? So what sort of what sort of copy time are we looking at here? <coughs> Yes. Would it be like row times columns times two? Like row times columns times two. So, so why row times columns? Because it's the matrix which mentions like the rows times columns. So, we're going to do it with row times. Okay. So, when making a copy of this matrix, say, say this is this T. And so, we've established this T. We've created some 2D array on the heap, assumingly, and, and copied the transpose values of A into that 2D array. Right? We now have this here. We then make a copy of these values here. Right? So why are we not just going to copy the pointer? And why are we going to copy the entire matrix here? Even up, even up. Because it's like a shallow copy, you have to create its own matrix since you're changing values. Right, so this is a very good, important design scheme and basic object-oriented programming. Right, whenever you're going to have a copy situation right, and a member is a pointer, you're probably going to want to define how you want to make that copy. And you can define this in different programming languages differently. In C, you can use a copy constructor to explicitly denote how you want to view the copy. Very likely, you're you're going to want to, right, depending on applications. But very likely, you're going to want to copy that entire matrix over. Right. Help with memory management, right? If you implement it in this way, right. right? So, right, we're going to make this copy here. So we're going to create this matrix. We're going to or allocate the space on the heap, we're going to perform the transpose, right? and then this, the bulk of this matrix, the actual 2D array, is going to be sitting somewhere on the heap. Right? And then we're going to return by copy, thus copying that 2D array, very likely, on the heap. Right? When we return from here, we're going to destroy the original copy, and just, we're going to pass on that, that copy of the transpose back to the, uh, the calling scope. Right. So, what do you guys think about that? Is that a reasonable way to implement this? See some disagreeing, some yeses and noes. You're both right. It's it can be reasonable in some sense, and it can be very unreasonable in other sense. I saw a no shake here. Why? Why maybe? Why would this not be most efficient? Like you need to create a new one and destroy it. It's kind of based on all space. Right. It seems quite unnecessary because we're out, we're taking the time to allocate this, this what might be a fairly large big chunk of memory here, right? and then we're doing the transpose in it. Right? Then we're just making a copy of it and then destroying one of the copies of it, right? the the original. And so right, this does not seem most efficient, uh, though. Right, though it does allow for you know decent object-oriented programming practices. Right, so, uh, we'll look at the another approach where we don't necessarily have to do this, but the trade-off is we're going to have to do keep track of a little extra memory management and to make sure that we don't have any uh, memory leaks. Even not. All right, so it's important to note that you can fairly drastically affect the time complexity and space complexity with some hidden syntax here. Right, this this. Simple return statement here it doesn't. If you look at it, you're not going to say, "Oh, this is going to be big O of row times all." Right? Associated with this line. Right? But if that's going to be a deep copy, it is going to have that time complexity and it is going to add that space complexity. So it's important when looking at code, pseudocode, realizing this and understanding this, and knowing that you can make things efficient or inefficient. Right? right by using particular syntactic constructs. And so keep this in mind when designing copy constructors, overloading the assignment operator, right, and things of that nature. All 
system. Any any questions about that? Yeah. So what would be the better way to return it as a pointer? And so we'll look at another. All right. So well, we can go ahead and step through it here. So if we decided to make this a pointer here. Let's say we need this uh, pointer needs new and allocated the matrix and on the heap. Right. So then we do this assignment using uh, pointers rather than the dots. Right. And then we return the pointer to the matrix. Right. Again, assuming we assign that as a pointer. Right. So what would the time complexity of this return statement be like at that point? <laughs> Right. Well, if this is simply a pointer to an object, right? if we just return the pointer itself, the pointer is just one memory address and one memory location. But the number of steps associated with that would just be one. Which is seemingly better than gross times cold. This would be copying an address rather than that. There is a trade off. Yeah. I was going to ask this is a trade off that you're then actually manipulating the gross matrix and not if we code it up correctly or code it up efficiently here. So still, we want to create a copy here or create allocated a like, new matrix here. Right? However, just we're going to do it onto the heap right? rather than here locally. Right? So somewhere in the heap, we will allocate this new matrix. Right? It will have its own 2D array. So we do have the, the space. We're not sharing space with the uh, original column matrix. Right? But rather than returning, a copy of the you know, pass by copy. We're not going to copy the actual matrix itself, but we're going to copy a pointer to the matrix, which will reduce the copy time significantly, going from big data of a uh, little call to big data of one. It's the copy of one pointer address. Thanks. Good questions and notes. <laughs> and any other questions? Even on? Mariel, even on? <laughs> yes? Well, what does syntax be for that like, second line? How would you create a matrix? Right. Create a matrix. Uh, just using the, uh, the uh, constructor, the matrix this equals new matrix. Okay. So with that logic, though, it's the point of like, why would you know, never always return a pointer? Why would, would it make sense to just only return pointers when you function? Because basically, you're not creating copy. Seems reasonable. Can anyone think of a reason why we would not ever want to do this? You can just like the basic reference, just like whenever you need it. So for example, let's say you have a function. For example, you're adding something, you're returning the the, 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 the value you want from it as an integer, but you return the 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 memory address and just for example reference the address whenever you need the actual value. Seems reasonable to me. Yeah. Is it because you're all about the limited to that one address? Because And you will be limited to an address. The address will be on the heap. There's some very low level pros and cons with respect to allocating things, time different soaps. And um, like you can just, right, when you pass this uh, pointer back to the calling scope, you can assign it to a, a pointer variable at that point. Uh, and so you'll you'll have a handle on it in that scope as long as you return it to something. So you'll have a way to access that structure. Yeah. I feel like if you knew when you were implementing the function that like you were going to use it in a way that made that data like, like vulnerable, like in that, in that like, statement up there with the um, A transpose to B. Um, if like a transpose is like a very important piece of information, and like you like that's a subject to manipulation in the way that you implement the multiplication, like you could theoretically like mess up whatever a a transpose would be. Yeah, so there is there is uh, there are some ideological best programming practices that might be slightly infringed upon uh, by by constantly passing around pointers, but the trade off here is generally in favor of. of Depending on how much overhead you figure out, like how big is the structure that, that you're going to copy or not copy. 
right? Uh, so I think what you might have been alluding to is the idea of being able to access things, you know, potentially out of scope, right? That is, you might have some sort of issue where you might start accessing uh, a transpose, right? So when you're reading through a particular piece of code, you might not necessarily realize that you're changing the value of a, because you might be doing it in a calling function. And so for readability purposes, right, that can be a little confusing. Right? That is a, a reasonable observation. And another one is just simply overall memory management. And if you're going to allocate something onto the heap within a particular scope, right, and not deallocate it within that same method, within that scope, you just need to make sure to wherever wherever this function is being called from, right, and wherever the, the returns pointer is going, it's going to live, and it just, right, in that scope, you're going to have to just sort of remember that you need to deallocate it at some point before the, the end of the program. And if you're allocating it on the heap, again, in your programming language, you will need to be explicitly deallocated. So just exiting from scope, right, it's not going to implicitly call the destructor right, for the pointer, and you're going to have to manually deallocate it. So that's the, the general trade-off, just extra memory management. You just have to make sure you keep your code organized. If you're going to explicitly allocate something, make sure that you explicitly deallocate it. Usually if you do that in the same scope, it's pretty, pretty easy to keep track of. If you're doing it in different functions in different scopes, it can be a little bit harder to keep track of. But as the designer, you can certainly keep track of it. So make sure that you clean up your, your mess on the heap. Right, really good observations and comments here. Even on off. No. Uh -huh. yeah. Question. Yes, so so you just mentioned the structure. So would you have to deallocate it like similar function? Because wouldn't, wouldn't that, that thing still be or like because because you're creating a copy of the, the one that you're, you're basically returning a copy of the one that the transpose one you created. So if you have to like deallocate the, 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 the first one, <coughs> like the one you're not returning. Right. Well, uh, in this implementation where we're creating an object in the scope, or the implementation where we're going to have to point your scope? So like in, just in this particular code. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if we right. So there's another issue here if we have the we're using a copy, right? We're using the copy return here, right? So when we escape this scope, I think is what you're pointing out there. The original copy of this matrix is going to be destroyed, right? And depending on on how or it's going to be implicitly, the structure is going to be basically called. Depending on how you put up your destructor, that may then go and chase the right, the, the pointer to the matrix and deallocate that for you. This is what you're pointing out, depending on how you call your was well, more thinking because, like, because you said that that, that end of the scope doesn't just doesn't remove the memory allocation. So, because you're creating, or is that when you're just creating the pointer? So you're saying, oh, wait, a minute. I, I think I short access. Again, these these are largely these are things that you're going to think about when designing. Your program, and I think you guys have some good experience designing the copy constructors. So building the, uh, the assignment operator and uh, building constructors, and doing these specifically when you have, and you have to be careful when you have a member that is a pointer. Right? Maybe what you didn't think about when you were designing these is what sort of time complexity or space complexity implications there might be. And so I want you guys to start thinking about that and thinking, you know, again, how efficient can I make this code without maybe going a little bit too far. Right. Such as maybe trying to do the transpose in place and destroying the original copy. All right. All right. Again, uh, uh, just a reminder about row major and column major. Right. In our transpose implementation, since you're doing i, j, and j, i, it's pretty hard to avoid that. Uh, just by doing a row scan or a column scan. And it's, there are maybe some other tricks you, you can employ to try to subset your, your matrix. Right? But that's going to be very low level dependent and things of that nature. In fact, in some of the traversals, such as when you go to the add, you'll see that you know, doing a row scan, right? if you have row major programming language or a column scan, if you have a column major implementation, right? will certainly reduce any caching delays and, and improve your runtime quite significantly. And so, again, whenever you have a 
large structure and data and try to traverse it smartly right, whenever possible. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Mitra's ad. I think I had a slate error here. I think I was just referring to the matrix and not a, an object itself. So, so here we have a, an add method. Here we decided to return the pointer to the matrix rather than doing a copy. Right, so to do this, first we create a, right, a matrix here. We're going to allocate it and all the heap. Right, then we have our loop, our double loop. Right, so we perform the sum, so we do 4i, 4j, row, uh, rows, columns are facets that change, so we have a row scan here. Right, our sum matrix is simply equal to the, the caller matrix right, and the right hand side matrix. Right, we add up the i and j values, we get to the four matrix addition. Right, you add up the values and the corresponding matching locations in the matrices. Right, right, then here I just explicitly know that we will, of course, I need to create a new matrix object and then right, return the results. Here, result is seems to be a pointer to a matrix. So, uh, in that sense, rather than copying the entire object and then possibly doing a deep copy on the member variable, right, we're just returning a pointer value. And then the extra overhead here is that uh, we're going to have to keep track of that pointer and make sure we deallocate it when the time comes. All right, so time complexity of this. Again, we have an embedded for loop. The other one's controlled by rows. Here one can pull by call. Right, so number of time calls. Right, so we're going to have a basic time complexity since we have a constant number of operations here. Right, we have a time complexity of this portion here. The time complexity of right, numbers times num calls. Right, for this. Depending on how we do that, if we've already we've already allocated the space and already assigned it here, right? So here, this is very likely a constant number of operations based on the size of the number of numbers. Right. And then here, right, we're just copying a pointer value, right, so that should be constant as well. And depending on implementation, this. I don't think it will automatically initialize in this version of C++, so this will actually be to go more. It depends on whether it's actually going to go through and initialize those values in memory to zero or not. And so depending on your programming, it's going to be zero uh, big data of one for big data of zero times calls. Yeah. Um, what would, so like, with a bunch like this, what would be a good time to deallocate the result? Would the destructure be insufficient? So, whatever this is called, let's say in the matrix and in the main. So, somewhere in main, you may have some matrix pointer is going to. Right equals maybe a transpose a okay. and so it's somewhere in some scope maybe then you're going to create the transpose of a and return the pointer back to some variable right assumably allegedly you're probably going to use transpose somewhere in some calculation. Right, and then at some point you're going to want to destroy it. And it's just out of pointer, right? And so you want to delete it. So the destructor wouldn't have any. This will delete, this will deallocate and your, the pointer to your matrix. Right. right. So at that point. And so then when that calls this, then the destructor for that particular object should then call it. And then inside of that, you should then deallocate the two dimensional array. Or your um, the two dimensional array. 
I believe you have a pointer to an object, which has a pointer to a Right, does that make sense? Yeah. Right, and so here we can reduce the the copy time significantly. Right, the overhead is just a little extra memory management. Keep track of that pointer. It's break time. Let's take a break. Two minutes, three minutes, stand up, do cartwheels, jumping jacks, get the blood flowing. I have a question about the constructor. Because also, so you got like no mathematical knowledge of matrices or the river and proceeded this stuff before. So maybe why this may be simple. Oh, three oh. Uh, Basic interest, like a teaser intro in Austria. Not that I remember. I mean, it's been a while. I had a two year leave of absence. Ah, okay. So my problem was also at CC. I don't remember any of the details about it. Right. Well, I'm going to try. I'm actually going to get away from using C in this writing. Just because I have the most. Yeah, so I feel like for the project, we have to go look at the old projects and stuff. So, but anyway, um, so when you have the constructor, you're going to be passing the from what seems like the number of rows or the number of columns your matrix has, or because you, because you have some sort of input data, so like how you're allocating this thing. Because if it's a two-dimensional array, you have to obviously tell it how many rows it has. Uh, inside, if you're passing it. So I'm, I'm just going to make a new one, so I'm going to make it like this, Okay. So I have a little constructor to create this, where you basically determine what it is, what's even in it. Because one part I haven't understood is how you can tell it what values are supposed to go to that matrix. Other than just making some uh, like So in here, you're saying you need to pass. I'm just asking generally how the constructor works. For meters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you would need to, well, you get have different forms of the constructor. Right? Within the constructor, you can just have a default one that doesn't do anything. So you have one that allocates on the space for a two-dimensional argument and identifies the way you call it. It's not that it's that that is the case that you very likely want to pass the number of So for this class you need multiple structures. But at least at least the way it figures out it's like you're you're just passing the sum up. Yeah, yeah, this is the other one you're passing. Yeah, this should probably pass the number. Or it would have to be in your other the here the transpose one that you pass the number of rows the number of columns. So would you really just let's say I wanted to create that two-dimensional Oh no, no, yeah. Just in the, in the other, in the other, we we are assuming that you're going to allocate the two-dimensional array to the constructor. Here, in this particular constructor, right? So I'm asking the technicality that we actually create the size. But basically, so basically, yeah. So if I'm calling this. So, I want to return to the state to determine the double the size of just the matrix itself. So it's the structure that you're basically just fixing that like double and it's like the rows and columns. It's really important. I've never seen this before. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to treat this as the idea that we're going to have to the array and we can allocate it however you like. I am going to ask a couple basic. So it's more like about, I think, the more the mathematical class. So, like, so when I'm, let's say I have to call you this. So, how do I then actually create that sort of design? So, let's say I want, I want to bring it just two rows and two columns. So, how do I tell it to do that? I think you can do it in. Well, it's C plus plus. 
Okay, so she, 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 she can do like that way with the array and C plus plus also. I think so. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know that you do C plus plus. So you want to put it on this thing though, right? Yeah. So you'll use the new keyword. There's a couple of ways to do it like that, but I think you can do it that way with the new as well. I was just more asking for precise about that structure if you're going to be double. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, let's continue on with our extremely exciting investigation of matrices. You guys are excited. I'm excited. All right, matrix multiply. Right, I encourage you, you're not homework in this class, so I encourage you to, to try this at home. Make sure that you have a sort of reasonable understanding of what's going on here. How to manipulate this structure. Prime matrix. All right, so a brief summary of our matrix example some of the design decisions we made, and then some implications mm -hmm. with respect to complexity. Right, we implemented as a 2D array, very intuitive, pretty, uh, pretty efficient. Right, in, in some senses, right, that allows direct access to, to the variables too. Right, the assuming change will, the size won't change in a matrix. That if you need to create a matrix, you don't think the size is going to change. Right? It seems like a reasonable implementation right, for the, the bulk of the matrix. Right, uh, our add algorithm, we implemented a row scan scheme, assuming that we have a, a row major programming language. Uh, again, this will reduce cache misses and will improve runtime right, from a practical sense. Right, uh, we implemented the transpose. Uh, in this transpose, we noted a number of different design schemes or design questions, decisions that we encountered, right, including should we make copies, when should we make copies, right, and how should we manage these copies. If not necessary, right, reduce the number of copies, especially if you see that you're going to be destroying copies, and right, we can probably make it more efficient. All right, so looking at our add and looking at our transpose, we had about the order of in, where in's the size of the input, in was number of rows times number of calls. So we had a big O of number of rows times number of calls for our transpose algorithm and for our add algorithm. Right. Largely, that's, that's about the best you can do if you have a matrix with in elements in it, in values in it, and you need to add those to some other item that has in values in it, you're, you're very likely going to have to do in addition, so that's a major assumption. Right. However, in some instances, we, we can make these assumptions, and uh, these assumptions have practical use. Right. And in many instances, matrices may have a, a small number of non-zero entries, meaning that the matrix is largely filled with zeros. Right. And such matrices are called sparse matrices. And one important observation with sparse matrix is that addition and multiplication with zero values is trivial, right? meaning that we may be able to redesign this structure and make it more efficient. Right? So if we can find, uh, find an efficient representation of a sparse matrix, right, that doesn't require us to perform zero plus zero right? multiple times within a for loop, right? but rather we can skip that step Right. And you can take the step of zero times some value. Right. We can improve computational complexity, possibly significantly, again, if our matrix is largely filled with zeros. Right. Here's a very small and simple example of a sparse matrix. So we're going to get larger gains, of course, we need it. So here we know that we have a, a three by six matrix. So we have about 18 memory spaces allocated for, for this particular matrix. And however, note that only three of them are non-zero. So, for example, if we were to think about this and say, well, the actual, what information is contained in this matrix? Well, we certainly need to know the number of rows. We certainly need to know the number of calls. Right? But rather than keeping track of all of these zeros, we could 
design this matrix such that we ignore the zeros, right, and just keep track of all the other values. <coughs> Unreasonable. You really need to keep track of all of those zeros? Probably not. And so let's come up with a concise representation of, of this matrix where we ignore the zeros. And so rather than keeping track of these zeros, we can represent all non-zero values as a tuple, specifically a three tuple, where we simply keep track of the row, the column, and the value of all of our non-zero values in the matrix. And so we can simply have a list of three tuples, which you can implement in a number of ways. Right, so here, rather than keeping track of this matrix here, we can keep track of this structure and where the I've stored the tuples row wise. And so this first tuple, 0, 0, 9, indicates that at row 0, column 0, and using programming in C, starting with 0. We have a value of 9. At row 1, column 5, we have a value of 2. And at row 2, column 4, we have a value of 1. Seem reasonable so far. Right, the first observation is this matrix is very large and there are a lot of zeros. Right, we're going to have a clear reduction in space. We don't need to keep track of that space. Right, and then thinking algorithmically, right, if we're going to do traversals, if we need to do a traversal for transpose, if we need to do a traversal for addition, traversals for multiplication, right, our structure that we're, <coughs> that we're storing our data in is smaller. The traversals will likely be smaller. That's the idea here. Before we proceed, I think it's important to note that in data structure design, it's very likely you're going to have some sense of a valid data structure. Right? That is, you're going to, for, in a very simple sense, very simplistic sense, right? so you're going to have three tuples here for our matrix. Right? This is a basic assumption of the, this particular design. We're going to stick with this design of our data structure. And therefore, one of these tuples shouldn't be a four tuple, for example. That would make our data structure invalid. We're programming our algorithm to operate on three tuples. Right? And we end up with a four tuple in there. Our data structure is invalid. It's an invalid state. The operations are no longer going to work. Right? It's a really simple uh, example. Okay. But in some of our more efficient data structures, we're going to impose other constraints, not just with respect to the actual number of memory spaces allocated and but sometimes we'll impose other constraints, such as order. Right? We might want to keep these tuples in a particular order. And we might design our algorithms to assume that these tuples are going to be in a particular order. Right? Therefore, this order is important for the validity of our data structure. Right? And if the tuples are out of order, for example, right, then our data structure, the state of our data structure would be invalid, right? because our operations might be assuming right, that they're in order. Yeah, it makes sense. We'll see an example. Right, so checking the validity of a data structure once you have these assumptions is very important. Sometimes when you perform an operation on a data structure, you'll need to then re-verify at the end of the operation that it's still in a valid state. Some operations may change the state of the data structure from valid to invalid. You need to make sure that that does not happen. So you can continue having a valid data structure. Right. For our matrix, right, I'm going to give us the solution first, and then we're going to sort of back up into the motivation why. Right. We're going to keep our tuples in order, right, by a row scan, a row scan order. So assuming that we're scanning the full matrix, right, in a row scan order, right, we're going to keep the tuples in that order. So essentially, we'll be sorting them by row, and then by column. So they'll be in row sorted of order, and then items entries with the same row will be sorted subsequently by column. Right, again, this will this extra constraint on our data structure is going to lead to some pretty big savings and computation later on. All right, so our basic design decision here. Let's see if it works. We're going to, we're going to represent it as three tuples. Right, and then, based on this design decision, we'll need to come up with algorithms. Right? Again, very similar to the design process for your project. You're going to maybe think of different design structures for your project. You might want to come up with two or three different options to start off, right? And then write the pseudocode for each of the operations, each of the ways you're going to 
interact with your data structure. Right? And based on your pseudocode, you might find out that some of these design, basic design decisions will lend themselves to very efficient method implementation, whereas others will lend themselves to very poor or force very poor or inefficient. All right, so let's do this now. Let's make this design decision for a sparse matrix. We'll list it as three tuples. Right, and let's design uh, the add and transpose methods for each. Right, so here's an example of a uh, sparse matrix. Yes, so here we go. Yeah, so design decision here, a really basic one to start off with. Right. You want to implement these tuples as <coughs> arrays. Like you have an array of tuples. You could have parallel arrays, one for each use, right? or we could have some sort of chaining scheme. Let's just go with a very simple uh, array implementation. Right, so here we have a, an example of a sparse matrix addition. Right, so let's assume that these represent two different matrices. Right, what's the result of this addition? Well, let's take a look at this. Right, we have to identify what the original matrices are. Right? You should also note that we have to keep track of the number of rows and holes in the matrix data structure because it's not necessarily apparent <coughs> just from, right, from our parallel arrays or our two-dimensional array, how we want to implement that. Right, so let's assume for the case of this particular example that we have, let's say, three by five matrices. So we'll assume this is three by five since we're doing addition, and we'll assume this is also three by five. And so the first matrix here, what does this represent? This represents that the zeroth row, second column, is a nine. Zero, zero, one, two, 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 Myself right, we'll see that the second row, third column is a two. Second row, third column is a two. And then the second row, fourth column is a one. And this is a pretty sparse matrix, right? We have a lot of zeros here. Does that seem like the original translation and interpretation of our structure? <coughs> Similarly, and zero one, the three, and two four, the two. And the rest we have zero. All right. In our original implementation of a matrix, we would need to keep all of this in memory, and then we would just go. Do a row scan and add up all the values. So the results. Right. We just start at i zero j zero. Add them up. Zero plus zero is zero. Right. And then we go down the columns first. Right. Zero and three is three. Right. Nine and zero is nine. Zero and zero is zero. <coughs> zero, and zero, is zero. Right. Note, of course, again that we're going to be doing a lot of zero plus zero is zero. Pretty wasteful. Right. And so how could we algorithmically get this process accomplished right, just at a very high level pseudocode with uh, data structures that look like this? Um, you only add them if the first number is identical. Right. right. And if not identical? If not identical, then the value is simply the value of the like, first number that we have is zero if there is no specified value. And add value and term into the result matrix. So add value and insert term. Right. And if not matching, I miss that. I'm sorry. Um, if they're not matching, then it's just the value associated with the term. Otherwise, it's zero. If there's no specification. 
right? So else we need to, and then, so the case where there's no matching terms, so for example, here we have a zero two, right? And here we don't have any zero two, right? So what would we do with this particular term here? Right, so we want to insert this term into our result. Right, into zero two. Right, just a very high level sketch here. Yeah. Could you also would be more or less efficient if you just check the first term match? First term match, then check the second term match. So yeah, so let's go ahead. Yeah, so then if none of the terms in the initial row match, then you just know that you don't have to do any adding, so after that first initial match, you can just include and make play. Then you would just uh, insert all the terms in the right place, but if it wasn't match, you can check the second row and see if it was one and then after, you find the two matches there. So what you're what you're saying is we can possibly take uh, take advantage of the fact that we have sorted these by row, right, and that we can just compare tuples, right, yeah. that have the same row, right. And once we know once we get past this, then, then we know that we're not going to reach anything with the same row. So anything after that point can't match. Right? So that is a, a reasonable speed up as well. And so so yes, these are the basic ideas here. So the basic idea here is right, we want to find these matching terms. Right. If the row and columns match, right, if they match, right, then we will just simply add the resulting terms. So for example, here we have a two and a four, and a two and a four. So in the location two, four in our new matrix, we're gonna have a value of two plus one. Right, if there's no match, right, then what are we doing? We're doing a an addition with zero. There's no match. So at zero, two, there's no zero, two here. So in the resulting matrix, we want a zero, two value of Right, so let's look at some ways we can get this accomplished in pseudocode. All right. So here, again, let's say that we want to perform A plus B, where A and B are matrices. C is going to be the name of our result. Right, how can we get this traversal done? How can we find pairwise matching with couples right, across here? We can do a loop here for so for each row in A. Check B to see if there's any matching. And so you can start here in A, right, and then check all of the rows of B to see if any of them match A. Right, so then we can check this one, right, and then check this one. I see that there's no match. Right, if there's no match, then we'll insert this tuple right, into C. And so C, right, we then have the value of zero, two, and nine in this particular example. Right, then we can go to the next row right, and check to see if there's anything at 2, 3 right, in this matrix. And again, we would we could do that. Right, see that there's no 2, 3 in this matrix. And then insert that tuple. Here, yeah. Could you initialize C when you're creating it to be all the zeros and then you're just replacing the non-zero entries? Very good question. So how are we initializing C? Let's assume that we can magically initialize C, and we'll get back to that. So I have a question for this method. What would you do if uh, E has more rows in it than, uh, than A? We're going to assume that we had some sort of fail safe and check to make sure that the matrices are the same size. They need to be the same size. But like, like, because they're like, they're like three rows, you're checking, so you're checking 0, 2, 9, 2, 3, 2. Or two so I assume that let's say the B in this case had four. So it wouldn't then the four like, row uh, not be like eight. this four you mean? Like it's a four tuple? Four I mean no, there's like like below beneath it. Like there's okay. like more the more in, like non-zero entries in that way. Yeah. Sadly one. I can't this is like this is the first it's the second this is the last one. I can't I can't add any more entries here. But let's make this a one and I'll add it. And then it's gonna be two, two, three, two, four, and four, five. Something like this. Right, so because then wouldn't, at least on that logic, would you just like miss the fourth row? Like, would it not, would, like, wouldn't be ended? Because you're just adding from A. 
quickly because you check it right. and it's not right. So another good observation. So, right. In iterating through A, when we get to the end, right, we're not necessarily going to add any entries in B that we didn't encounter. Right. And for this reason, we need to have this another for loop where we can do the same thing but start in B and compare to A. All of that. The, 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 you're supposed to do both. It's not the one that It is, uh, again, a very, a very good observation. All right, yes. Can you explain why if you go through the opposite way and then go over me and check A? Yeah, what, let's, what is this? let's do it. Let's do it. So, all right, uh, so we've gotten here. So now we're on this node here. So we're in this particular tuple. We're now going to compare to each of these tuples here. We compare to the first, no max. The second, right, there is a max. Right. All right, so what do we do? We add the results. So we're going to have a two, three, or a two, four, and then a three. That makes sense. You guys are looking at me like I'm speaking Greek. Okay. So we have a, a two, a four, and a three. That's great. Right. So if we were done at this point, right, as you indicated here, right, which, is this the results? Right, we've we found all of the rows in B that match A. Right. We've completed, in a sense, this part of our, our looping, our traversal here. Is this the correct result? No. What are we missing? Now, we didn't check to see if there are any tuples in B that weren't in A. By scanning through A and checking B, we've identified all of the elements in A and all the elements that A has that B also has. But we didn't identify the elements that B has that, that A does not have. And so we need to perform this second loop here. And so in this particular second loop, what we'll do is start with each row in B, compare to see if there's a match in A. Right, if there is a zero, if there is a match, right, then well, we would add that term, right? But that, if there is a match, that case was already accounted for in the first loop. So if there is a match, right, then don't do anything. Right? That term should already be added in our first loop. Right, what we're looking for are the terms in B that are not in A. Right? So zero, one. And so we'd scan through here. Right? It's not there, not there, not there. All right, we need to add this term, zero, one. And then here, right, we have a two, a four, and a two. We scan through here, we find a match, do nothing because it's already been added. And in fact, we already did that operation in our first scan here. All right. right, so now, what do we think? Pretty good? Is this the correct result? Kind of, sort of. Let's see what we say. All right. Well, let's let's look at two things here. Number one, we mentioned allocation. All right. So how how do we allocate this if we're implementing this structure as an array, array of tuples or parallel arrays? And so here, I just sort of wrote these tuples down as though this space was already allocated, and we allocated the perfect amount of space. Is there a way that we can algorithmically scan through this and determine the resulting number of tuples in the sum? <coughs> well, we could, we could possibly upper bound it and then lower bound it. Let's, let's start there. What's the minimum number of spaces we're going to need? All right, so let's look at allocating C here. Does everyone understand what I mean by allocating C? Right, before we before we before we start the potential insertion or adding terms and couples into C. We need to initialize it to a size because it's an array. So we need to allocate C. So what's the min value of C going to be? Yeah. Right. In this particular instance, so how did you come up with three? Sure. And so. Generically, we could say that right, the min value or the min size of C. 
right, will be the max size of A or B. Right, A, B, max size. Right. Yeah. Ooh, very good observation. All right, so what happens if we get a, a zero? And so this lower bound is not account for. What if the sum is zero? Right? It's possible, for example, if all of these terms match in an extreme case, if all of these terms match, right, and the A value is negative in, and the, the B value is positive in, and you add them, you're going to get a zero. So it's possible you could get an empty seat. You could just have a zero matrix, all zeros. Right? So here's a a min size without keeping track of how many sums get to zero, right? But an absolute min size might, might actually just be zero. The result could be an empty right. Yes? A really good observation. So in order to determine our lower bound, our spacer, we would have to, in fact, go through all of the additions to determine that, right, to determine the allocation. All right, so what would the max size be? Yeah. Well, in this case, size. Right, so in this particular case, five. And so you got this. Okay, just adding the, the length of one plus the length of the other. Right, that's a good upper bound. Worst case. So, best case, right, all the terms match. Right, and you're just going to have the min value, or if they end up adding to zero, you might get you know, even less than the min value. Uh, some of the terms add to zero. Right, and the in the worst case, right, the maximum amount of size, you're going to need size A, right, and size B, assuming that none of the terms match, and so you're just going to insert each of them. Seem reasonable so far? Mm -hmm. So as you noted, the, right, the, in order to determine whether the sum is going to be zero, we have to perform the sum, meaning we have to do the addition, right, to do the allocation, all right. Is this the case in general? If we need to allocate C, so not just in this special case where we want to determine if the result is C, right? Is there any way to determine how many matching terms we have between these without actually traversing it? And comparing. I can't think of any. It seems about the most concise representation of this data. If we have an index at zero two, in order to determine whether we have an index at zero two over here, we need to check if there's an index at zero two. We need to do this for all of these indices and all of these indices. We need to at least, at least minimally speaking, scan each of these objects once to do that comparison. Because that's the minimum amount of information. We know where those calls, where those calls. If we want to see if there are any matches, we need to at least scan each object once. Okay. Right. Right. So again, we'll be able to speed this up. So this implementation here, not very efficient. We we can improve our scan approach and take into account that we're keeping these values in order, which is why we made this decision. Otherwise, we might be relegated to this very inefficient piece of pseudocode here. So looking at our pseudocode here, what is the resulting time complexity of this, this pseudocode here? 
And so we have a, a looping structure here. Right? We're going to go through each value in A, or each tuple in A, each term, we'll call it in A. Right? And we compare it to each term in B. And then we do the reverse. We do the same thing in B and traverse A, find a match. And so what is the, the time complexity of this? Yeah. Alright, so, yeah, so uh, we're going to have the num terms of A. Right? And what do you guys think? Does that seem reasonable? Isn't it like that? Because then you do all the numbers. You can keep that there for now. All right? Any any comments, suggestions? Okay. All right, so here we have the for loop. We're looping through the items in A, right? In each one of those iterations, we then loop through all the items in B. We do the same through B. So if we were to implement this you know, pseudo code, right, we would have an embedded looping structure very likely. And so we're going to loop through the items uh, in A. During each iteration, we're going to loop through the items in B, right? So we're going to do number of B steps, number of A times. And right? so this particular loop here, we're going to have on the order of, I'll just do C for a constant. Right, num a times num b. Right here, we have the same thing. We're looping through b, right? And then in each iteration of that loop through b, we're looping through a. And so again, here we have about a constant times, right? Num b times num a number of steps. We add this up, we're going to have two times some constant, right? Num a, num b. Right, using the big theta notation, you can drop the constants. This is a good overall step count. Right? It also indicates the overall inefficiency here is that we're doing a double traversal. Not only is each traversal inefficient, but we're actually doing an un seemingly unnecessary second traversal, right? Which we can improve upon. Uh, so this is not a very efficient approach, and it certainly does not take into account that we're keeping. These structures organized by row scan order. All right, we're going to take a break and we'll hit back up here and see how we can do better. This massive amount of distribution, though. Oh, I'll try to go backwards here. Twice here. Twice here. Well, please remind me. Yes, you, you're not sure. It's two times. Yeah. Two to two, not sure. Okay. Yes. All right. All right, guys. We'll pick back up here and see how and if we can, or if and how we can improve on that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.